So let's get started with our first talk on the new science of interconnectedness from Professor Tom Oliver. So Tom is a professor, researcher, and author at the University of Reading, where he leads their ecology and evolution research group. He is a prominent systems thinker, advising both the UK government and the European Environment, Environmental Agency on Policy. He has published more than 80 scientific papers in world-leading interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary journals and won two first-place prizes for essays communicating science to a broader audience. Professor Oliver's writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Independent, and BBC Science Focus, and he's the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Self-Delusion, the, Sur the Surprising Science of Our Connection to Each Other and the Natural World. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom underscore H underscore Oliver. So I'm really excited about this talk and this event. So uh, Tom, whenever you're ready, um, just get started and, and good luck. Thanks, thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to be here. and, and um, yeah, I'm honoured to, to be able to speak to you all and it's lovely, you know, this kind of online interaction, seeing people coming from Wales and Burnley and Newcastle and Singapore. So, yeah, welcome and um, yeah, hopefully you will have an interesting morning. I'm really looking forward to the uh, question and answer session at the end as well to really um, discuss some of these ideas with you today. So, uh, as Niall mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, what, what's called here the new science of interconnectedness. Um, I'm going to break the the talk into sort of two parts um, and we'll have a, a short break after the first part. I, I, I'm not sure how the timings will work. Uh, um, I've put a kind of point in my talk where we'll, we'll break but we, we might go a bit further beyond that depending on the timing. Um, so yeah the first part really is about how we're connected. We, we have this sense of um, this intuitive sense of being discrete entities, uh, kind of living in a cockpit and controlling uh, our lives. But actually, when you look at the, you know, um, the physical uh, nature of our bodies or our psychology, we're deeply connected to the world. And I'm going to hopefully convince you today that we're maybe more connected than we sometimes intuitively feel. And then the second part of the talk is really about, well, you know, why that matters. And it does matter. I would argue for things like uh, mental health and uh, the, the health of the, the global environment. So anyway, let's let's jump in. Um, actually, um, there's a poll, and I'd like to get your responses if possible before we start. Um, and I, I'm going to kind of ask you this question, or you can see it on the screen. And if you could have a go at answering it, and it'd be good to get that kind of feel uh, of your responses before we. We kind of dive into this um, tour of our of our connectedness. So I'll just uh, I'll just wait a short moment, and we'll revisit this question in part two of the summary. I'm going to note down the overall scores just to get a, so I remember. Okay. So we're kind of getting the average being in the middle at the moment. Uh, C. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. That's excellent. So we're gonna we're gonna jump in now um, to part one. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna ask you this morning, this on this lovely sunny Sunday morning, to open your imagination. And you might ask, you know, wh wh why do we need our imagination? This is a, a science. Uh, talk, but actually, you know, lots of the world um, is hidden to our unaided senses. Um, we, you know, we've evolved a, a number of senses: smell, taste, uh, sight, to um, to perceive the world in a certain range, uh, a certain bandwidth, as it were. But actually, you know, lots of the the machinations at the fine scale, at the submolecular level, or the the vast temporal uh, gliding changes in galaxies is, is far beyond anything we can we can uh, experience and of course science can can help us um, with uh, ways of observing the world but actually when we then want to tie that together to knit together our understanding you know, the danger of science is it becomes so specialized in these these, uh, these certain areas with you know a very detailed reductionist ways of understanding you know how cells work uh, and special uh, ways of of um, inferring those different uh, patterns and, and changes 
But actually to draw that worldview together, we really need our imagination. And um, yes, yeah, so you can see here in the orange box that, that, you know, our limited perspective and because sometimes, you know, we, we um, especially in the modern day in, in, in our kind of modern sciences, we can get trapped in these silos and, and we, we fail to, to, to join the dots together. And we can see ourselves falsely at the center of a small world because of our perceptions being on a daily basis are, are kind of limited. So I'm really going to ask you to open your minds today and, and um, think about some of the science and imagine um, s some of these processes that are going on. So to start off with the imagination, um, I'm going to ask you to imagine a, um, a scene. So it's a, I'm just going to read a bit of text here. Um, so I want you to imagine that it's a stormy night in Chicago. The howling wind and rain are dashing against Victorian window panes of this old infirmary. Lightning reveals the form of a man hunched over a table with a scalpel in his hand. And then he writes, and this is, I'm gonna read this from, uh, this is uh, what someone called R.M. Forbes wrote. The subject was a white male, 46 years of age, Death was due to a skull fracture as a result of a fall. Dissection of the cadaver to obtain the various organs and tissues desi desired for the study. So he raises his scalpel now and looks over a, a form on a table. Performed on a stainless steel table covered with a polyvinyl sheet, soft tissue samples prepared for analysis by first being diced in a porcelain bowl with stainless steel knives. So this perhaps slightly macabre scene sounds like it could be from some sort of gothic horror fiction but actually the, the text i read um, written by r m forbes dr r m forbes from the university of illinois was um was taken word for word from a scientific paper in 1953 and um dr forbes was uh, was trying to understand what was the composition of our of our human body now for many years um the idea that we were made of, um, the idea reigned that we were composed of these four, of four humours. Before that, there was um, from the kind of Far East and, and in ancient Greek, there was this idea that we were made of uh, elements, fire, earth, air, water, and a fifth element, ether. Uh, but actually then that, that view transformed from, um, from Hippocrates initially, describing the human body being composed of these formers, uh, humors, sorry. And that's maybe because when you uh, take blood and you allow it to separate out, you have these different uh, layers that correspond to the, the red blood cells or the, uh, the, the plasma. So these four humors were described as yellow bile, black bile, blood and phlegm. And it was thought that the balance of those uh, humors in the body could affect our, our physiology, our, our well-being and our emotions as well. So, so words like um, describing someone's mood as, as melancholic was thought to be of a sort of excess and imbalance of black bile in their body. Uh, and someone might be described as sanguine or choler choleric or phlegmatic. So this view actually held for hundreds of years, in fact, um, so you know, Hippocrates was, was 400 BC or so, but actually this view of, of the, the body being composed of humours held until about you know, the 1800s, in fact, and the advent of modern medicine. And it was only through experiments like that of Dr. R. M. Forbes, uh, slightly kind of uh, crude and with his, with his polyvinyl sheets and his porcelain bowls and stainless steel knives, that started to find out what was in the human body. And actually, maybe he found it was not as exciting as, as something like ether or air and fire. But actually, you know, here's a quote from, um, from a Sherlock Holmes novel. <clears throat> a Sherlock sits beside the fireplace with his friend Watson and says, My dear fellow, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive the things of which are, which are mere commonplaces of existence. And this idea that, you know, when you study the science um, and really understand, perhaps it does seem a bit more benign and, and commonplace. You know, we are actually made up, and these are the results from Dr. Forbes' study, which actually, amazingly, even though he carried out in 1953 with his basic techniques, they've been replicated, and these percentages of elements in our body have, have, have pretty much, um, he got it right, essentially.
65% oxygen, 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen. And then there's a whole set of other elements and trace elements like, uh, you know, argon and mercury sort of in tiny amounts in our body. But actually, um, you know, it seems commonplace that, you know, we're simply made of the same molecules that make up everything else in the world uh, and not as exotic as those, those previous uh, ideas. But I, when you take a, a more detailed look at that, that science and try to sort of, uh, well, use your imagination to, to, to think about some of these things. For example, where do those elements come from in our body, the, the atoms that form our body, and where will they go to when we die? Um, I want, let's just have a think about that now, in fact. Um, so the body is made up here, you can see, of 65% oxygen. Now, the reason we don't all uh, float away, float around the room, which you know, would be quite uh, entertaining, is that um, that oxygen is bound and the, and the intermolecular forces between oxygen, hydrogen and water um, have a high, high density and that causes us to, to be heavy. But we have about 40 kilograms, so 65% of our bodies is about 40 to 50 kilograms of oxygen. So let's just imagine those, uh, the number of molecules there uh, they were gathered into our body from what we drank, uh, from what, the air we breathe, from the food we eat. And when we die, they'll simply be recycled back into the earth, you know, if we're buried or if we're cremated. Let's just imagine that if we um, are cremated and the oxygens in our mo in, in oxygen molecules in our body were to burst forth, let's imagine they're going to burst forth into the atmosphere, they're going to stream out of your body and um, they're going to spread around the entire atmosphere of the earth and if you imagine this um, line which is uh, called the carbon line it's generally defined as the edge of the earth's atmosphere um, that line is 100 kilometers high so i want you to and i'm going to ask you a question in a moment you can just post it into the chat your your uh doesn't matter what answer you give just the first one on the top of your head so i'm going to ask if all those oxygen molecules that were in your are in your body right now to burst forth and they're going to spread themselves equally amongst the atmosphere. They're going to swirl in eddies around the, you know, the tundra above the tundra of the Arctic. They're going to float across the Pacific Ocean and they're going to spread evenly around the entire globe. How far apart would the average oxygen molecule be that was once in your body if they spread evenly? So if you're anyone who's brave can just uh, pop into the chat their estimate of how far apart each of those oxygen molecules would be that were in the body. Let's have the first brave person. 100 kilometers, Jared, thank you. Um, Elena, Elena, f five, is that five bil billion kilometers? 4,000 kilometers, one meter, oh, let's go lower. 1,000 kilometers, oh, billion, yeah. Okay, one centimeter. Good, well, thank you for all the guesses. Um, you're, many of you are high. Graham and Chris were close with one centimeter. So the actual answer, is those oxygen molecules would be 0.3 millimeters apart. So they would be spread in a, in a cloud around the entire earth, 0.3 millimeters apart. So you could take a cubic millimeter, uh, sorry, a cubic meter, so that's about this big, a cubic meter of air from anywhere above the earth's um, surface. So let's say, you know, above London, we go up uh, 20 kilometers, we take a cubic meter of air and we look inside that, there would be 29 million uh, molecules of oxygen that were once in your body. So a dense fog, and that's mingling, that's mixing with a dense fog of molecules that were once part of other bodies. They were once part of sharks, of dinosaurs, of plants, of wallabies, of shrews. And that's in the air all around us right now. So when we take a breath in, and if you do that now, let's sit up in our chairs, take a deep breath, you're breathing in a zoological legacy. You're also breathing in molecules that were um, not just once parts of plants and dinosaurs, you're also breathing in bacteria. Um, we shed from our bodies uh, about a, a million particles every hour. And many of those are, are bacteria. We have um, bacteria on our skin. We have about 400 species of bacteria uh, in our elbow joints. Um, we've got bacteria in our mouths about a thousand species there. Um, behind our ears, there are about 125 species, depending on how often you you've wash, I guess. Um, and also in our guts. And I've, I'm sure you've all read articles about how 
you know, the bacteria in our guts, our microbiome can actually uh, change our, our moods and our emotions and change how we feel on a day to day basis. So, again, that detracts from our supposed individual autonomy. And these bacteria, you know, they're, they're, they're on our skin and they're, they're, they're coming off our skin and they're floating around us. And in fact, if you use some quite advanced uh, molecular techniques, you can take a sample of the air from around you now um, and you can process the DNA and it will be uh, your own uh, signature. The own microbial signature is kind of following you around in, in a cloud. So if you're sat in a room with someone else uh, today, uh, then you're breathing in the bacteria that are part of their microbiome as well. So, you know, these bacteria are, are, are part of us. In fact, um, we have, oh, let's have another, let's have another uh, guess, shall we? We have 37 trillion human cells in our body. 37 trillion human cells. Does anyone want to have just a quick guess how many bacterial cells in our body? So 37 trillion human cells. Um, let's see, we're getting 100 trillion, 150 trillion, three times that, 40 trillion. Okay, thank you. Some, some good answers there. And, and I'll unfortunately have to say that there is a lot of controversy or, or uncertainty around the answer. And uh, re recently, you may have read that we have 10 times as many bacterial cells in our body. Um, so there's even titles of books called 10% Human. But actually, they've, that, that figure has been revised downwards slightly. And it turns out it's around maybe a one to one ratio is the current consensus. So we have about 38 trillion bacterial cells in our body versus our 37 trillion human cells. But it's still an awful lot. You know, we're by number, we're, we're half um, bacteria. And obviously, we have also viruses, virus particles in every um, organ of our body, including our brain, crossing the blood brain barrier. And that, that forms our virome in, in totality. And then there's fungi and there's protozoa, um, small single celled uh, organisms in our body. So we re really are a kind of living ecosystem. And, uh, you know, we're actually closely related to those bacteria. Um, if you take, uh, you know, you often hear that we're related to each other, more than 99.5%. Uh, so all of us on this call right now, you know, we're, we're over 99.9%. .9%. We share the same DNA code. And chimpanzees, um, I don't think there are any on this call, but chimpanzees about 95% similarity. And that's you know, the type of things you read, but actually uh, slightly less known about is a simple bacteria. Uh, you share about a third of your, well, 33%, yep, a third of your, of your DNA with those bacteria. So it's exactly, it's not just similar, it's the same code, the same uh, uh, nucleic acid code that's in you, a third of that is in those bacteria. Because obviously we evolved um, from uh, those bacteria and you know the tree of life is is closely connected and actually we often imagine the tree of life as this kind of linear linear tree but genes are spread horizontally so horizontal gene transfer um, often you know obviously we pass our genes on to our children and that's vertical transfer of the dna but equally uh, genes can be vectored between individuals between different species in some cases um, by viruses. So viruses incorporate those genes into their code and then when they move uh, and, and, and jump between hosts, they can sometimes transfer genes. Um, and actually of our 20,000 human genes, about 145 uh, were thought to have arisen through, through that horizontal gene transfer. And some of these are genes that we really need, you know, for the, um, uh, the placenta in mammals. Part of the, the, the building of the placenta is derived from uh, genes that were not ours. They were transferred horizontally from other animals. So our body is, is an ecosystem. And actually, these bacteria not only share our body, but if you look at inside a, a cell, inside a, a human cell, we have these organelles uh, called mitochondria. 
so these are the these are the they make energy in the cell they're the powerhouses of the cell um, but actually these mitochondria were derived from single celled um, simple bacteria like organisms and they were engulfed by another cell right back at the bottom of this diagram in the evolutionary tree they were engulfed by another cell and this was called endosymbiosis one uh, cell becomes living inside another and that process led to these uh, multicellular animals that became humans so you know even within our cells we there are our protobacteria so we're we are a kind of chi chimera i guess and just a last uh, note on on that dna you know that we you know physically um our bodies then are you know if we stand in the mirror and, and, and look at ourselves you know you say well this is me this defines me this body here i can feel it but actually as i said the body is made up of of many different organisms um there's turnover in those cells so you know your skin cells may only last uh um two weeks your gut lining cells only last five days your red blood cells last four months the body is continually being rebuilt so actually many of the atoms uh, that were you know that are just turning over scavenged from the environment and so okay well what's building the body what's what's keeping it look looking like me as i look in the mirror you know albeit gradually getting slightly older well it's the dna of course that's the instructions to build the body with materials scavenged from the world around us but actually that dna is simply borrowed from our ancestors um, and it's the same code that occurs in all these animals they share elements of the same dna code and then obviously when we have children if we have children we pass on that dna to ancestors to come so we're simply borrowing the information yeah chris exactly like triggers broom so there's a um there's a Only Fools and Horses episode, uh, if anyone's familiar with, I'm sure most of you are, um, Only Fools and Horses and Trigger um, says, I've had this broom, I've had this broom for, I don't know how many years. He says it's had, it's had 10 different handles and five different heads, um, but it's the same broom. And it's an interesting, you know, philosophical question. Is it the same broom if all the material, if it's got different handles and different heads? And actually that, that um, analogy comes from a, um, a story called the ship of theseus and it's a greek uh, philosophical question about a ship where every bit of timber has been replaced over time is it the same ship um, and i think that's like our bodies you know we're we're transferring all that material energy is passing through us materials are passing through us so maybe then it's the information that defines us but as i said it's the information that's simply borrowed from our ancestors and that we pass on um, to generations to come so uh, you know when you look intuitively our, maybe our bodies are more connected and, and there's no there's nothing like a discrete continuous entity so then okay what about our minds because if our bodies are simply you know uh, the, the boundaries between our bodies and the outside world are fuzzy. What about our minds? That defines me, isn't it? You know, what's in here? But actually every, every word, every touch, every pheromone that we, uh, that's a, every smell, chem, uh, smell chemical that we receive, it changes the neural network in our brain and, um, and changes who we are. So in the human brain, there are about 170 billion uh, cells, <coughs> neurons, mostly neurons and these are packed into this uh, intricately folded layer about three to four millimeters thick so quite thin called the cortex um, and when we learn the there are new connections made between these 170 billion cells so that's a huge number of, of potential connections that can be made and um, experiments in in mammals such as rats when they're developing and learning up to 250,000 new connections can be made every uh second so that's 15 million new connections made every minute and there's obviously connections are lost as well so um you know and it's how we learn isn't it how we you know if we're learning our, our piano uh, essentially 
there are new connections being made in our brain and forging broader kind of neural pathways which make those pathways more easier for the um, electrical currents to throw, flow through. So it becomes like a well-worn path. Uh, Donald Hebb's, um, well, actually, he was attributed of saying uh, that um, neurons that wire together fire together. So the more they, those electrical currents are, are rooted up, the broader and easier it becomes. So they become like well-worn pathways. And pathways that we don't use start to become overgrown and, and eventually disappear. So the brain is rewiring itself, but it's not doing it uh, just on the basis of, of, you know, weeks or months. It's happening every, every second, every moment. And every um, input that we get, you know, every smell, every sound, every, every word is, is changing our brain. So let's, um, let's just do a thought experiment, because actually, again, this is a, a bit like this Sherlock Holmes quote, the kind of, um, you know, the miracle of the everyday, you know, tele uh, telepathy is, is something that seems, you know, um, you know, uh, fantastic sci-fi. But actually, you know, our brains are connected all the time. Our brains are connected um, right now. And if we just do a thought experiment, I'd like you to uh, imagine, I mean, to visualize in your brain, you can close your eyes if you want, um, and visualize a pink circle, a pink circle, bright pink, with a bright green triangle in the middle. Okay, if you're holding that in your head, a, a bright pink circle and a bright green triangle. Got it? Okay, so what we've just successfully uh, transferred a concept which is represented neuronally. So it's represented in the electrical patterns in my brain. And it's been transferred through the words that I've spoken, uh, that, that kind of, um, those ideas um, have gone into the airwaves, uh, the signal, the pattern of, of airwaves. It's gone into the microphone, it's gone into digital bits that has gone through the internet um, and it's coming out into the airwaves into, in, from your speakers, and then it's gone into your brain, and it's caused uh, changes in the neurons in your brain, the electrical currents that are representing or were representing a pattern, which for you uh, is representing a, a pink circle with a green triangle. Now, admittedly, it's not exactly the same map of neurons in my brain that, that map onto your brain. Our, our brains are wired up differently. But actually, the concept that it's producing is similar, if not equivalent. And this is amazing that, um, you know, on an everyday basis, we are, um, we are transforming each other's brains through every word that we sp speak. And it's not just the spoken word, of course. It's the... Um, you know, you open a book and maybe hundreds of years ago, the author uh, had neurons in their brain producing concepts that are transferred into words on the page. And when you open that book, uh, you know, maybe thousands of years later, the, the concepts leap out and transform the, the electrical connections in your brain. There are also... Um, hidden ways. So obviously the spoken word is something we maybe choose to listen to or we choose to read. But actually there are ways that we are um, influencing each other that are very hidden. So there are a couple of nice experiments um, on with sweaty t-shirts of all things. And um, you can follow up the references here if you're interested. One of them is um, about uh, putting people in a stressful situation. So, uh, for example, in an exam and, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the first one I'll, I'll give you is skydiving. So they, uh, they get participants to go skydiving and they're quite scared and they're sweating. And then they get a control group to sweat, but in a non-stressful situation, just going to the, to the gym. Then they take these two t-shirts and they present them to people and say, have a smell of these. And, um, they smell mildly sweaty. It's, you can't tell the difference. But actually, if you're those people that, that are smelling uh, are in um, having the brain signals uh, mapped at that moment, and that moment is finding that um, the fear response is triggered in the smell from the skydiving uh, treatment. So the amygdala, this pro part of the brain. Um, 
involved in fear responses is much more triggered from, from those pheromones than from the control set. Another study uh, is working with dentists and asking dentists to um, do some work on a, on a, um, a mannequin, essentially, um, you know, what they train on. And that mannequin is then wearing a T-shirt. And the T-shirt can either come from a, um, a, a, a study where people have been uh, in a stressful exam situation or a control. And the, um, what they find is the dentists tend to make more mistakes when they're smelling the, um, the T-shirt that has come from the stressful exam situation. So it's not only those pheromones are not only affecting the way we feel or the way we think, they're actually affecting our actions as well, the likelihood of a dentist making mistakes. So there are these hidden uh, influences that are transforming our brains all the time. You know, if you're in a room with someone, they may be influencing your behaviours without even, you even knowing. Um, <clears throat> also an interesting life lesson now, I guess, don't go to the dentist uh, after you've been skydiving or in a stressful exam, I guess. So uh, I'm going to give you another example now of um, hidden connections. This is Charles Whitman. Um, he's an American, uh, he was an American ex-serviceman. And he was, a, you know, uh, as far as anyone knew, a normal person. Um, and until he, he wrote the following, I'm going to read it now. He said, it was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight after I pick her up from the telephone company. I love her dearly and she has been a fine, as fine a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. This is what he wrote in his notebook before he then proceeded to uh, plunge a knife three times into his wife's heart while she slept. He then killed his mother, similarly, before proceeding to climb the University of Texas tower. He had seven guns and ammunition in a bag. At the top, he killed a receptionist and then he shot two families behind him on the stairs. And then he got to the observation platform and he shot a pregnant woman on the ground below. As her husband ran to assist his dying wife, Charles shot him too. And in the shooting spree, he killed a further 16 people and wounded around twice as many more. So imagine that you are a judge um, and you have to sentence uh, Charles Whitman. You know, what would, you know, what would, what is an appropriate sentence for um, such a, uh, you know, these cold calculating uh, acts? But actually, when you delve down into this story, uh, there's, there's more complexity. So in um, Charles Whitman's suicide note, he said, I do not really understand myself these days. I'm supposed to be an average, reasonable and intelligent young man. However, lately, I cannot recall when it started. I have been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. And actually, in the same note, he then requested an autopsy to be performed on his remains when he was dead to see if there was any discernible biological causes for his, uh, his aggressive feelings and his intense headaches. And actually, he'd been to the uh, doctors several weeks before complaining about these headaches and these strange uh, feelings that he was having. And it turned out when they did perform the autopsy that there was a tumour in Charles Whitman's brain and it was uh, compressing the amygdala again. And this is uh, the circuitry involved in uh, regulation of fear and also aggression. And some studies in, in uh, monkeys have shown that um, when there's damage to the amygdala, you get a range of responses like lack of fear, um, blunting of emotion and overreaction. And female monkeys, um, female mother monkeys, when they've got their amygdala damaged, they often neglect or they physically abuse their infants. So they, um, for Charles Whitman's case, they convened a panel of um, um, psychiatrists, of uh, neurologists, of um, neurosurgeons and psychiatrists, pathologists as well, to, um, to, to question whether the tumour in his brain could have driven these behaviours. And they conceded that, yes, it was probably likely that actually the violent um, behaviour of Charles Whitman was caused by the tumour. So, you know, what, what on the surface seems like a simple case. Okay, here's a 
here's a cold calculating serial killer, you know, evil, if anything, you know, um, he must be punished. We suddenly see someone who is innocent, but, but for um, a nuance in biology, which is driven by, you know, mutagenic effects from uh, radiation, background radiation, uh, or carcinogenic chemicals, which then can obviously um, change our physiology, which changes our brain, which changes our, our behaviors. So just to give a, a, two more examples of these hidden uh, influences that affect our minds. Um, this is a nice book about social networks. Um, and actually, we all know in the social network that, well, firstly, we choose our friends. So, you know, they say birds of a feather um, flock together. And we tend to have similar, you know, uh, fashion sense or, you know, similar sense of humor to, to our friends. Through kind of quite detailed statistical analysis, the researchers kind of, kind of account for these effects. And they find that uh, people influence each other even beyond that. So you start to become more like the people that you interact with. When you think, okay, well, that's kind of obvious. You know, you know, your friend starts wearing some new boots or a new style and you think, well, yeah, that, that does look good. And maybe you start to gravitate towards the same sense uh, of style or music taste, etc. But actually in these social networks, they found that um, you can be influenced by people that you've never even met, never even interacted with. So up to three links away in these networks, um, your taste in music, your voting preferences, um, your risk of obesity can be influenced by people that you've never even met. So, you know, all the time we're being um, influenced by the, by, uh, the world around us, whether it's spoken word, whether it's pheromones, you know. And on the final thing I'll say on this um, topic of our, of our connected uh, minds here, these um, inventions, the incandescent light bulb, thermometer, telephone, steamboat, hypodermic needle, um, and many more. When we think of inventors, we have a kind of myth uh, in our Western culture, at least, that, uh, that inventors are these kind of lone geniuses, you know, lone wolves working together, producing these amazing inventions. And of course, they are, you know, clever, innovative people. But actually, all the things here, the light bulb, thermometer, telephone, steamboat, they were invented in multiple locations at much the same time. And in some cases, for example, the, um, the light bulb, uh, when you really look into this, it was invented in independently by, about, by almost 23 people. And um, obviously Thomas Edison receives the, the popular credit for it. Um, but 23 people invented that light bulb or a very similar device in different places. Uh, the telephone, uh, Alexander Graham Bell would be your, your textbook um, pub quiz answer, I guess. But actually another inventor, Alicia Gray, filed a patent for the telephone on the same day as Bell. And, um, you know, these uh, inventions, they're, they're not, um, these aren't just great uh, inventors working independently. They're not lone wolves. Actually, innovation is part of a great uh, linked creative human endeavor. So the old cliche, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, we are, we are harvesting ideas, thoughts all the time from the world around us. And these inventions are almost ready at a certain point in history to be birthed. And if they weren't in birth in one great mind, there'd be another great mind that they would be birthed in, or they actually happen to be birthed at the same time in different places. And they're almost inevitable that there would be these inventions. And there's a nice quote I'll read out from um, someone called Jeff Mulgan, an author of this book called Connexity. And he says, the idea of the genius creator is being modified as attention turns to the far broader river of culture, which expresses itself through individuals as much as the other way around. And I quite like that idea that the, um, this river of culture is flowing through us. We are not just individuals um, in a river of culture. The river of culture is, is flowing through us, uh, just as we simply pick up um, all that existing science and literature and, and understanding and, and build, build from it. So just before the, we're going to have a short break uh, in a moment, and I just want to um, 
think about this this idea of this sense of self. So just to bring it back a little bit, I started off saying, um, you know, we have this intuitive feeling that we are independent, you know, discrete entities, and um, you know, physiologically. Uh, you know, physically, we are deeply connected to the world around us. I've convinced you of that with the bacteria and the the DNA, and psychologically, you know, we're, we're, our minds are porous. You know, we're we're constantly uh, being influenced and influencing the world around us, and yet we do have this sense of of uh, strong sense of individualism. And I just want to take a moment to think about the the, the nature of illusion. Now this illusion on on the screen um, is called the Penrose Stairs. Um, it was invented by this chap. Uh, well, the idea was was first um, uh, revealed by this chap Reutersvard, but actually L Lionel and his father Roger Penrose um, developed the idea further, and then it was made more famous in these lovely lined drawings of the artist M. C. Escher. This is a simplified version, but the idea, obviously, if you start at the bottom of the page, is that you can uh, walk up the stairs, apparently walk up to the right, and then you turn a corner and you carry on walking up uh, the screen, and then you turn a corner again and carry on walking up, and then the last leg, you're back to where you started. Now, we know that, um, we know, logically, you can't keep walking upstairs and end up exactly where you started. But that's the nature of the illusion. That um, an, an illusion is where something seems one way. We perceive it to be one way, but it's not true. And I'm a, I'm arguing that our sense of self um, as a discrete autonomous entity is such an illusion. We perceive it to be um, that way, but actually it's not true. And even if theoretically we grasp like an illusion, like like the Penrose stairs or any other visual illusion, you know, you, you can grasp it theoretically and say, okay, yeah, the lines are the same length or yeah, the stairs don't always go up. But then you turn away and you, you know, you talk with someone else and you look back and suddenly it's snapped back, snapped back to perceiving the illusion again. That's because obviously our perception has evolved in a certain way. Uh, our brains interpret information in a certain way, which makes us biased to to suffering those illusions and that's i would argue the same for our sense of self that we've evolved uh, this sense of self we've evolved to perceive the world and have this um, sense of self as this kind of um, discrete nucleus this kernel this cockpit that we sit in but actually it's an illusion and after the break um, we'll come back and um, think a little bit more, unpick a little bit more that illusion and really think about what's driving it and um, crucially what the consequences are of, of being susceptible to that illusion. So if that's okay, I'll hand over. I, I know we're a, we're a minute early, but um, I think this is a, probably a good place to then um, have a quick break and then regather after that for the next the next leg. So that was a good, uh, the, the timing worked okay. Um, in terms of the next part, um, I would like to pick up again from that, that idea of uh, this evolved sense of self and, it's, and it, the nature of the illusion. So why did we evolve this sense of self? Um, why did we evolve an illusion, essentially? Now, we obviously need a sense of, of being this kind of coherent uh, entity because you know we need to um, have it's a way to collate memories uh, to find food for example we need to kind of uh, be able to relate that to this kind of sense of an individual we need to um, track our social interactions in these groups you know we, we would have evolved in groups of about uh, you know small bands of maybe 50 people and um, is that sound better? Just check, I just saw the, a comment about the sound. Let me see if I can just adjust the headset. Um, so this um, sense of uh, being an individual, 
we needed to th to track those social interactions in the group. You know, what so and so said about me, and what I think about so and so. You know, there's a very complex set of of social interactions that we need to track. So that sense of self is needed. But if you think about these group sizes, um, you know, maybe fifty to a hundred people. Um, if if I'm too selfish, if you imagine a, a spectrum, I guess from from complete sort of selfish. Uh, individualism at one end, only looking out for myself and no one else, to a much more kind of collective, communitarian uh, sense of identity at the other end. There's a kind of scale, and if I go too far down the scale, um, so we, what we're ta we're not talking about here is um, you know abolishing the sense of self because we can't uh, we can't survive without a sense of self. You know, it's not about abolishing the sense of self. What I'm talking about is um, is refining our, our understanding of the self in light of the science. And when we evolved, we had this uh, sense of self. And if it had been gone too far towards the selfish side, uh, you know, I, if I was to steal food from the group or to steal someone's mate, then I would be, you know, uh, I'd be chastised or I'd be physically beaten or I'd be excluded from the group, which would threaten my survival. So there's kind of checks and balances between working together for the group and the sense of, of, of being an, uh, looking out for yourself and being selfish. Now, if we zoom forward to the modern world, we interact with groups, not of 50 or 100 people or 1,000 people, but actually 7 or point, however many it is today, billion people we can interact with. Um, and our, 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 our networks have become potentially globalised. But actually, our, sen our, our kind of moral uh, framework hasn't become uh, globalized in the same way. And actually, the checks and balances on, um, you know, preventing damaging behavior to others or the natural world are, uh, are not in place. So in the group, you know, in the small group, I talked about the, the band, the evolutionary band. If I damage the, the local environment, ruin the camp or hurt someone else, I get punished. In the modern world, with a click of a button, I can choose to buy a, a product and the impacts ripple across the world. And, you know, it may be a product that contains unsustainable palm oil and it's leading to the destruction of, of um, rainforests. It's, it's leading to the uh, driving the extinction of species like uh, orangutans that are now threatened with extinction because of this uh, impact and also in some cases having social impacts. So although you know our, our economies have become globalized, our kind of regulatory system, whether it's legal or whether it's our moral framework, hasn't ha had the same evolution. So that's problematic. It's, uh, it's a case where something has become um, maladaptive in the modern world. And it's not just the way, you know, it's not just about biological evolution, it's about cultural evolution as well. And um, our culture has changed. And, in, you know, in the Western world, there are many influences that drive this sense of, of individualism. And whether it's our media, you know, for example, saying, you know, you're worth it and telling us that, uh, you know, we we should we deserve all these these products and we should consume whether it's our education systems trying to help us build self esteem or build ourselves as a brand i mean what a crazy you know in if our if our personalities and our minds are dynamic and porous what a crazy thing to try to build a a, 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 um, a concrete brand that's unchanging of course that's going to lead to some kind of cognitive dissonance and stress and anxiety um our government influences us i mean this is a picture of margaret thatcher who famously said there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. And maybe I should have updated this with, with Boris Johnson recently in the press. You may have heard, of course, saying, uh, you know, the vaccine development was um, because of capitalism and greed, even though actually much of the vaccine development was funded by public science and people, you know, choosing to work beyond um, what they're paid for because they have this sense of greater identity and, and um responsibility so uh, you know we're, we're being pushed from influences social modeling from government from education from media pushed ever further along this continuum towards selfish individualism so we already evolved with a with a tendency to have the sense of individuality and it's been exacerbated by culture um, 
you can see that in some of this uh, this data for example um, the maps on the left sorry about the resolution it's a little bit poor but the details don't matter too much in terms of um, what we've got here the colors bluer colors are increases countries that have increased in either individualistic practices on the top or individualistic values on the bottom and that's increases over the last 50 years and you can see the majority of countries um, from this analysis uh, by Santos uh, references at the bottom that um, is this shown that there's been increases in individ individualism over time and that's probably because of these cultural changes um, the figure on the top in the middle is just to remind me to talk about narcissism and that's the um, obviously the more extreme side of, of individualism where we carry out behaviors which are very likely to be damaging to people around us and even our kin and um, we just don't care about anyone else essentially so that can be tracked through this narcissistic personality inventory and many studies um, I mean a lot of these studies have been focused on student populations um, but broadly there's there's evidence to show that narcissism has been increasing at least in in many countries like the US over recent decades and then there's lots of other studies for example looking at words you know you can look at I mean this uh, phrase all about me has increased massively in frequency but there are many many other phrases phrases that linked to a more individualistic outlook um, and these words are more popular, they're more common in books, in songs, in popular culture. And lots of studies now tracking how languages is changing, reflecting this increase in individualistic mindsets. But as I say, it's become maladaptive. And um, the reason I'm showing a burger here um, is because I want to give an analogy with another trait, another biological trait, which in a similar way has evolved because it was beneficial but actually in a different context in a modern context it becomes maladaptive now our tendency to eat sugary or fatty foods is useful you know it, when we evolved those food sources would have been scarce so you know it, it's important to, to seek them out but actually in our modern world they're now hyper abundant and actually our cultures, you know, our advertising kind of, it, the products are in your face, they're cheap, it's easy to get them. Um, that has led to uh, an epidemic of obesity of the world's population, two billion uh, of the almost eight, so over a quarter are obese or overweight. And in the UK, countries like the UK, that's over 50% um, overweight. So those are shocking statistics and that's why the quarter of the world's population doesn't have enough food and is malnourished it's become maladaptive this trait uh, and it's exacerbated by by cultural changes and in a similar way i'm arguing that sense of self evolved because it was adaptive but in the modern context as i said in our globalized economies uh, and because of these cultural influences uh, this kind of unchecked um, uh, promotion of this sense of, of uh, egoism it, it's become maladaptive and I argue it's driving this mental health crisis that we face um, you can see some statistics here one in ten children have a mental health problem only a quarter accessing treatment um, one in five older people and 40% of people in care homes affected by depression quite shocking really 17% um, of UK adults on antidepressants and that, you could argue, you know, OK, to what extent does this come from a very uh, individualistic, isolated sense of identity or a whole set of other factors? And of course, these are complex issues that a whole number of other factors relate to this. Um, and we don't really have time today to go into this particular aspect. But, you know, there's just a few papers from literally, a, you know, five minute search on the Web. Lots of studies really linking um, essentially what is common sense if you feel isolated because you have a more uh, um, atomistic sense of identity if you feel isolated then you tend to be more lonely and you suffer the mental health but also physiological symptoms of loneliness i mean a whole set of diseases physical diseases linked to these issues as well these psychological issues um, so even in the modern world you know we can be more connected you know we're more connected than ever digitally 
but actually if psychologically we feel isolated then we suffer these impacts so mental health is one aspect of that maladaptation of this um, individualistic sense of self this highly excessively individualistic sense of self but also we're suffering I'm sure I don't need to remind you, it's hard not to open a paper nowadays and see one of the stories about ocean acidification, loss of corals, biodiversity loss, air pollution, uh, droughts, wildfires, um, deforestation, animal-borne diseases like the pandemic, which is also linked to degradation of the environment. And <clears throat> these are driven by a kind of death by a thousand cuts. This is a picture of, of actually, if I look out the window now, I'm in Wallingford, which is between Oxford and, and Reading. And on the hill up in the, the field, there's some intensive agricultural fields outside my house, which is, you get a nice view, but also reminded of how intensely our kind of um, agriculture is managed. And this picture was an abandoned orchard. Um, and actually there was lots of hares and foxes and butterflies and birds and I walked past one morning and it had been cleared completely and you can just see in the, there's three big piles of of dead trees that have been piled and they were later burnt and this is a you know it's a it's not a massive area but it's relatively large several fo football pitches uh, of land there and these types of effects lead to this this uh, loss of um, wildlife in this case and in a similar way you know can drive you know we have similar effects that drive pollution and, and carbon emissions etc some of my research is um formerly i well i am an ecologist by training an applied ecologist and i was lucky enough to work with these schemes which study these lovely butterflies you've got here the orange tip on the bottom right you probably see this at this time of year actually it starts coming out in late march april so these are flying now, the green hair streak in the middle and the comma on the top left. Um, and we can use these schemes to explore the impacts of this, this wild, um, land use degradation. This is the ringlet butterfly. Um, it likes sort of wooded areas. And I'm just going to show you one sort of ecology result to balance out some of the, um, the things we've talked about. Um, this result is on the on the left here, you have remote sensing data. It's called satellite data. So satellites above the earth looking down, you can see you know, what areas of woodland in green or arable fields in orange. The black line is a butterfly transect. So volunteers walk these transects. They're about one to, to five kilometers. And they record the butterflies they see in a box that moves with them as they walk. And uh, they're doing that at multiple sites every week throughout the year. And I used to do that as well. It's a nice excuse to get out on a sunny uh, lunchtime and collect some data. So each of these points here is a site. And what we're looking at on the, the vertical axis is, is how the abundance of those butterflies change when there's a drought. And you can see the zero line is no change. So most points are below the zero line. When there's a drought, these butterfly populations crash. But interestingly, they crash more where there's less woodland in the landscape. So even in the wider landscape, when you start destroying that woodland, the butterflies are much more susceptible to the effects of drought. So you're getting this interaction between climate and land use change. And uh, from various uh, collated models across multiple species, we can work out that the chances of a butterfly population surviving drops from about 50% when there's sort of well-connected habitat to about 10% when the habitat is fragmented. And so when things happen, like this orchard being destroyed, that really reduces the probability of these butterflies persisting. Incidentally, this is under the most benign scenario of climate change. Um, and actually under more se severe scenarios, we start to see further losses. And so when you put these results together, you really see how susceptible our British wildlife is to land use change and climate change. Now, of course, we've got a whole set of other species, not just butterflies. You know, there are 44,000 different species in the UK. And you can work with different types of data where people send their records in. And it's a bit more difficult to analyze because obviously you get more records where there's more people. So you get lots of records coming in and around big cities. Uh, and as recording gets more popular over time, you get more, more people, uh, more records coming in. But th these can be analyzed and, you know, you can work with a whole range of different um, 
conservation organizations and they've produced this amazing report which is called the state of nature report understanding what is the state of our uk populations and it's not good you know these species are declining so this is what i spent eight years doing uh, in my career was was working to understand to to, to nuance the the loss of biodiversity uh, but it's quite a depressing way to work because it's just you know where are the solutions to these problems and that's what i then started to work on was saying okay well um what if we put habitat back into the landscapes so for example these strips of uh, field margins and and flowery corners of fields um to, to kind of reconnect populations and there's whole um people that make their careers out of developing spatial models to say well how should we configure these field margins to allow biodiversity to be restored but actually the elephant in the room is that most of our landscapes look like this and if you look at some statistics 70 percent of our land is that intensive uh, cropland arable fields or intensive pasture and the actual habitats that butterflies live in you know for example this calcareous grassland is about one percent left um, so you can, you know, work out how to configure these field margins. I mean, you are literally tweaking, you know, tinkering at the margins of the problem, because the problem is that we've devoted most of our landscape to intensive food production. So then you start to say, well, OK, how do we change the food system? And that's where you need to come out of ecology and maybe think about economics and even other disciplines. So you're faced with this challenge now from saying, well, how do you transform this big global food system that's causing all these impacts 60 percent of biodiversity loss 24 percent of greenhouse gas emissions etc and i was lucky enough to work with a whole range of different um, uh, academics at the university of reading and to try and understand what are the factors that prevent the food system um, being changed and transformed to something that doesn't destroy our butterflies and our foxes and our hares etc and doesn't drive emissions etc now we group these into different um categories and we had people from business school from development from psychology from um agriculture and just to give you some examples some are about you know lacking recognition of environmental impacts maybe supermarkets don't un don't know how harmful the products are that they're that they're stocking you know how much damage they've they've caused or maybe um economic factors perverse subsidies we actually pay our farmers to farm in a way in a certain way and that has been damaging traditionally to biodiversity and these are the sort of obvious responses that you get so why you know why is the food system locked into its current uh factor there are also some what we call biophysical constraints so for example if you've destroy, destroyed all the, the bees the pollinators and the spiders and beetles that would eat pests you're kind of then locked into using chemicals to control pests so you need to restore the bees and the, the natural enemies before you can go back to more sustainable farming but actually the big the big gap here is this one called social cultural constraints and bringing it back to the psychology angle this is massively underrepresented in in government thinking in academic thinking is is these factors that are that are kind of locking in the food system and one of them here is uh well i'll give you an example of two one is belief in techno fixes this idea that's you know okay we're losing pollinators but let's just invent robotic pollinators then we don't need the bees um you know and they've invent people have invented little drones that fly around and try and find flowers and pollinate them and then you say well okay well how, where are these little drones going to get their energy from and you know you don't want to have them carrying around batteries that then cause toxic effects and they say okay well let's make them renewable and and you think well hold on we've got these little machines that that are completely renewable they feed on flowers and and uh, deriving their energy from sunlight and they pollinate all our plants let's just not kill the bees then we don't need to invent billions of little robots to try and pollinate every wildflower in the whole world you know but this kind of belief that we can just uh, develop our way out is a is a real psychological a barrier in some cases to addressing problems another one though relevant to today is this idea of limited collective identity you know if you've got government saying every, you know greed is good you know stick out for yourself you know why why should you bother about paying a little bit more for a product which is fair trade or protecting the rainforest um you need that sense of um 
of, of, of global responsibility to, to really change those consumer behaviors. So <clears throat> here's a nice quote um, from someone who is a, an administrator, so the, uh, a leader of the UN Development Program. And he said, he used to think top problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, climate change, and we need good science. But he was wrong. Top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And I think this for me is where we start to get at the root cause of some of these issues. And just so I started out and it may seem a bit tangential, you know, talking about um, an orchard nearby and the butterflies and how to, as an ecologist, my approach to dealing with those problems. And I guess I've kind of mirrored what James Gustav Speth here has said is that the, the problem, uh, the solutions don't lie in, in ecology uh, or even economics. They lie in, in uh, people's mindsets ultimately. And I'll come back to that at the end. So I want to talk a little bit about um, um, solutions. Actually, Niall, if you're there, can you just give me a, um, a, a reminder of how much time, what time do we stop for the questions? Just so I can balance the... 11.40 for questions, but we're flexible. You know, so you've got about Super. 25 minutes or so there left, but... Super. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I just don't. Yeah, I want to sort of give this ample time, so I don't want to sort of race through at the end. Um, so I'd like to spend a little bit time now talking about about the solutions, um, because a lot of those big problems, um, the mental health crisis, the biodiversity crisis, climate crisis. Hopefully, the, the example that I gave, and the reason I went into a bit of detail there was so you can see that a problem which might seem on the face of it simple, you know, how do we deal with um, biodiversity loss while well, we just put some more margins in, actually becomes a, a deeper problem about how we structure our economies, how we structure our socio-ecological systems, um, and really trying to change mindsets as the root cause of some of these structuring factors. Some of the solutions, really, um, lie in in science partly but not exhaustively of course so science can help in in measuring and understanding changes in self-identity so um the survey that i asked at the start where well, surveys are a, a generous word it was a one question survey um there are a number of metrics to look at um how we feeling how we feel our self-identity overlaps with nature and just from the responses, I think we kind of got most people in the middle. There are about, I'll read off when I, when I looked, there was about 2% A, 9% B, 38% C, 28% D, 27% E. Uh, that probably doesn't add up to 100 exactly because they were changing as I was writing them down. But essentially, most people were kind of in the middle with a little bit more on D and E, which is, is promising. Now, I, I, I've... What I would argue is that there's a real, oh, we've lost the um, video. Ah, oh, here we go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the final scores, um, most people in the middle. And what I would argue is that, you know, having identity around A or B is very damaging. And actually, it's interesting that many of our um, our leaders are much more uh, um, shifted to those A and B side. If you could go back to the slides, that'd be great. Thanks. Thanks, Noel. Um, so there are various metrics we can start to measure that now because you know many for many years you know um uh, philo philosophy and religion has been has been talking about the kind of um these needs for a broader sense of identity and and connecting with other people and connecting with nature but actually it's only in recent years there's been this kind of surge in in this field environmental psychology for example where we can start to measure this in a quantitative way. So the one, the one question survey I gave you there, there are more detailed surveys with names like nature in a self index, nature connectedness scale, connection to nature index. They all, all broadly um, say the same thing, that um, you can start to quantify these metrics. And what they find is that when people score higher, um, and they, they, their sense of self has this greater overlap with, with the natural world, then um, 
they t people tend to be happier actually and they tend to have more pro-environmental behaviors so they recycle more they reduce their carbon footprint they choose care you know they're more likely to volunteer for environmental causes so some really positive um relationships from these these attitudes around connectedness with actually real world effects so in terms of uh, um, interventions that's what's one of the how, how do we shift mindsets um, towards a greater sense of connectedness uh, to nature um, now interestingly there was a um, I'm just going to go back a moment there was a, a, a an ecologist called Arnie Nace uh, and he came up with this field of deep ecology it's called his idea was that if we have this sense of self which he called an ecological self that overlaps with with nature then um, so you know we see ourselves uh, we identify with our family often and this sense of kin and you know looking after them is not really altruistic we do it because we identify with them but maybe we can extend that sense of kinship to the rest of, of the world to other species to other people and it sounds optimistic and Arnie Nace's idea that it is if we can develop this sense of ecological self then you know saving uh, a rainforest on the other side of the world is not an act of altruism it's not harming myself uh, you know to, to help another it actually becomes an act of self-care because your sense of self is extended to incorporate them and actually that's quite an ambitious theory because often if you read into some of these studies of group identity the reason that we, we we tend to look after our in group and whether that's our family or our football team or our tribe and we do that because we have a sense of antagonism with the out group what arnie nace was saying was can we expand our in group to be to cover the whole world but then of course we don't have an out group so do we still get the benefits do we still get those benefits of an in group but actually yes these studies are on nature connectedness are finding that when people do have this sense of of ecological self as nace called it where you overlap with the natural world then you do tend to have these more pro-environmental behaviors so nace was right and this was in the 1970s he was coming up with this theory and it's only more recently through these metrics in environmental psychology and linking those to then behaviors and attitudes around environmental protection that you start to see uh really in concrete terms the benefits now it sounds like a really great day you've got lined up because you're going to hear about uh, sort of meditation type approaches um there's a really nice book here and i'm sure you'll hear more of the science um later today about how um meditation actually transforms the brain and leads to changes in our sense of identity actually that the, the processes in our brain which create this kind of program which runs our sense of self is is depressed in in um meditation and in long-term meditation we have this this greater sense of of um overlap of identity with other people and that leads to greater compassion and empathy so that's another intervention um outdoor community activities you know engaging with nature is great on our own but also with other people working in the community building up that sense of shared community identity uh, another intervention is computer training now often it might seem a bit um non-intuitive because often we think of computer games you know people locked in their rooms uh, playing on a, with a computer how is that building empathy how is it building overlap with the rest of the world but there's certain very specific types of computer games that have been designed for example <clears throat> there's one game which was designed to try to improve empathy and it involves space exploring robots crashing on a distant planet and um the the players have to gather pieces of a damaged spaceship um and to do that they need to build emotional rapport with the local alien inhabitants so they these inhabitants speak a different language but they have human-like facial expressions and the players have to try to understand their their expressions and communicate with them this also sounds a bit you know a bit wild but actually what they've done um is to try to understand how um children and they've measured how children who play the game for several weeks show transformation in brain networks related to empathy and perspective taking and um yeah they, those neural networks develop around emotional regulation develop more in the children that played the computer game that did that did, played a different game so they are you know starting to see here how you, you know even digital technology can be used to enhance uh our self-identity and, and expand our self-identity 
And final, the final point, I guess, I want to talk about about learning. Really, is um, you know, there's some evidence that reading fiction books helps with perspective taking. You know, you put yourself in someone else's shoes. But what about popular science? What about the stuff I've talked about today? You know, imagining your molecules spreading out and and imagining your DNA, etc. Does that, you know, those visualizations can they help change our sense of self? And that's what I was interested in with with the book I wrote, um, and. The idea here, some of the things I've talked about on the left here, uh, really sort of what I've covered in the first part of the lecture about um, our molecules and our neural networks and our brains transforming. And I really wanted to test, okay, whether, you know, it's nice to, to write a book, but is it having an impact? Can it actually transform the way people think about their connectedness and lead to those benefits? And so what I did is, um, and the QR code leads to a survey. So I was asking people to, to um, uh, take one of these nature connectedness surveys, but also a social connectedness survey as well, how you feel your sense of self overlaps with other people. And to do that before reading the book and after. And then we could see, I could try to see whether, and there is some provisional results that there is a significant change in, in at least nature connectedness. And I'm hoping with a bit more sample size that the social connectedness um, might be significant. But the idea whether yeah, reading the book can lead to lasting changes in those attitudes. Because obviously you can prime people and, and you can, which is why I asked you to take the survey, the one question survey before, because obviously if I just talked about all our connectedness, then asked you, then maybe you'd have um, responded slightly differently. But would that effect last? You know, a day later, would you have bounced back to your normal level? So we're really thinking about lasting changes in, in transformation of attitudes and, and personality, I suppose. So that was my attempt to see whether there can be an effect of these kind of um, of presentation of scientific ideas around connectedness. So a whole suite of interventions here. And, and, and I guess really it, for different people, it depends what is better for them. Um, you know, we're all different and different approaches, whether it's sitting, engaging with nature, observing nature, or whether it's being involved in community activities, everyone will have their, their different pathway. And I've talked a lot today about different disciplines or or implicitly, I guess, different dif disciplines have been involved. You know, we've 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 talked about biology, cell cell biology, um, neuroscience, psychology, ecology. These are all academic disciplines, um, but obviously some of the approaches here about arts and humanities, about practice-based pursuits, and this goes beyond uh, academic, you know, academia. And um, I like this quote slightly provocative um, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau saying, I hate books. They only teach us to talk about things we know nothing about. And I think he was probably being a bit provocative there on purpose, but what is the knowing that he's talking about then? And I guess, you know, there's this other type of knowing from direct experience, this kind of ex experiential knowing that we don't necessarily always get from um, just the gathering uh, information reflected also in this quote from Eliot. Um, and when we're thinking about transforming self identities to overcome this sort of illusion of, of independent self, then um, it's good to think about the kind of importance of introspective approaches and practices. So, for example, you know, we talked about neural networks and how um, networks that are well used become cemented and easier to use in the future. And it's the same with our, if we're overcoming this illusion, we need to work hard, we need to build habits, new ways of thinking, that we, we're not susceptible to falling into the trap of this kind of egoic thinking. I like to think of, a, you know, an Olympic archer, you know, they fire an arrow into a target 100 meters away. And you could explain to someone, you know, if you explain to me theoretically how that was done, and I understood it in absolute theoretical detail, I couldn't then pick up the arrow and fire it into the target. Because it's about how the neurons, um, the neural networks in my whole body, my physiology is, is, is structured to be able to do that. And that takes practice. It takes that transformation of those physical networks. And it's the same for the way we think that, you know, it's not just about that kind of theoretical understanding. It's about putting into practice those efforts to build habits of new, new ways of thought. But obviously, I think the theoretical understanding is important because that can give us the, the motivation and the incentive to build those practices. And we really understand what they're what the aim of those practices is and the endpoint. So 
just to start to wrap up, I guess, um, I hope I've uh, convinced you that the sense of self as a discrete uh, individual, as this, you know, being these isolated entities is, is an illusion. You know, our bodies are intimately interwoven with the world around us. Um, you know, we're, we're built from material scavenged from the environment. The, the materials are turning over all the time. The, the instructions that that uh, that, that uh, develop that body are simply borrowed from ancestors, and we pass them on. And psychologically, we're you know our minds are porous, and their the ideas uh, and smells and um, they're, they're all transforming our brains. And we're we're highly connected to people around us. And some of those are more obvious um, and explicit, like uh, how we understand words and how they transform our brains. Some of those are hidden, hidden factors as well. And we involved a sense of self, though, because it's it's um, it's adaptive. Uh, but actually, in the modern world, I'd argue it's becoming maladaptive. You know, we suffer a mental health crisis, and it's been strongly linked to this sense of isolation. And and it's been shown that when people feel less isolated on these metrics around their sense of identity, when they feel less isolated from other people, they tend to be more um, happier, they're less anxious, they're less susceptible to depression. And equally, when they feel more connected to the natural world, they're, they're more pro-environmental in their behaviours, and they're reducing these, their carbon footprint, they're buying uh, food sustainably, etc. And we really need those pro-environmental behaviours. You know, we're, we're suffering an interlinked environmental crisis, whether it's, you know, biodiversity loss, climate change, ocean acidification. And these are driven by these, um, this, this consumption, this, this, this demand for, for products. And, and part of that is, is our, can be mi mitigated through a more um, globalised sense of responsibility. Um, our choices, you know, what we buy, how we choose to travel, they're kind of multiplied eight billion times, everyone making those choices. And that creates this tidal wave of destruction, which is essentially, you know, destroying the world that we're, that we're living on. Um, so I think the root cause is changing our mindsets and our self-identity. <clears throat> and, you know, some people disagree. They say, I, I, you know, they'd like to think about things at the proximate level. Let's, let's put a tax on carbon you know, an economic lever. Let's create a new environmental legislation, you know, a regulatory lever. And these things are important, but it, but we also need to address the root cause of the, the demand, which is causing the, the, um, uh, the those impacts. And if you think about those fixes as well, the carbon tax, the regulation, um, those institutional elements, they depend, our institutions depend on our worldviews. You know, they depend on our... Um, they depend on our, our self-identity and, and how we choose to vote and, and um, develop those institutions. So actually at the root cause is those, those mindsets. So if there's one thing I'd like you to take away, I guess, from, from today's uh, session, I guess um, it wouldn't be a bit of information. I guess it would be a, a feeling. It would be that feeling of kind of, ideally that sense of awe, that sense of connectedness that we have with the world around us. And really that the, kind of recognition that some of these big global problems that we face that seem so daunting that some of the solutions that they lie you know within us right now so i'll end there and just say thank you very much for for listening um i kind of completely lost track of time at the end because um so i hope there's a bit of time for q a and i've put some additional reading there and i've also pasted um from my book some additional other books that you might be interested in to read about that obviously the text is too fine to read there but just for your notes um and yeah be, really look forward to engaging you further either in the q a or feel free to follow up by email as well so thank you very much for listening i really appreciate it and thanks for now for inviting me hi tom so that, so that was an absolutely fascinating presentation so thank you very much for for sharing that with us really appreciate it um as a first question I'd love to ask um, if you were taxed with the job of creating a curriculum for people to develop an, an ecological self and to develop this, this feeling of being sort of like having this interconnectedness to the planet, um, what would go on that curriculum? What would you, um, 
what would you be teaching people? Let's say it was over the course of, I don't know, three months or, or, or six months. Um, what would be the core things you'd be teaching and how would you, like, how would you approach it? Would it be a mixture of reading? Would it be spending time in nature? What would, how would you approach that? Yeah, well, I think that's a great, that's a really great question. And, and I, I have thought a little bit about, how, yeah, that, those kind of questions about whether there are ways to sort of um, structure some kind of learning resources that could to, could expand on, on some of the, these ideas. And I guess, yeah, I mean, without giving it too much thought, I, I, it'd be good to draw in different disciplinary approaches into that to make it really broadly interdisciplinary and, and as I said the, some of the the insights that I just talked about today come from a range of different you know biology psychology neuroscience cognitive science um, and I guess it could be focused more on the sort of um, evidence that there is this illusion uh, this self delusion but I think as I said I to me it's crucially important the kind of practice element as well and um, it'd be good to look into some of the science and there's so much stuff going on out there about, um, you know, people have got in touch with me, for example, about, you know, they're doing a, a dance, re, sort of developing a PhD in dance on the ecological selfhood or something, which sounds fascinating, you know, like how you, through arts and humanities, how you can maybe change people's sense of identity. And I think there's so much you could go into, um, into different interventions and maybe then, whether it's feasible to take a sort of science-based approach where you're kind of quantifying the effectiveness of those interventions so that we can be kind of most efficient in terms of spending our time. So for example, like, and maybe you'll cover this later on about meditation, there's new approaches for neurofeedback where they measure people's brains as they meditate. And so you, you can, through bio, it's called biofeedback, you get you get feedback on how your brain is changing as you're meditating. So you can kind of more quickly get into those states. So rather than having to spend 10,000 hours and become a kind of expert at, at meditation, you can do it much more quicker. It's a bit like sports science, I suppose. It's kind of, you know, using science to improve the performance in a physical activity. Um, so I think it, it could go down those more practical lines as well. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. It's, yeah, to give it some more thought about yeah. That's really interesting. And in terms of the neurofeedback, are there any apps or anything that um, are set up for this, or is this really advanced technology that would cost cost a lot of money? Do you, are you aware of those? Uh, yeah, I think the the neurofeedback is is quite advanced technology because they're essentially um, they're doing like fMRI imaging whilst people are meditating, and 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 that's how they get these studies of understanding how parts of the brain related to you know empathy are kind of lighting up and compassion are lighting up more in those meditators but um yeah i don't think it's at the stage that we can with any apps yet um but yeah i'm sure there are ways to 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 harness new technologies in clever ways to to improve our connectedness um, cool cool okay so we've got an, a question from jared here um he says that my view is that ecological self-awareness tends to develop when the grip of numbing capitalist industrial self is challenged in some way, for example, in COVID lockdowns, or when we have an emotional wake-up moment, for example, seeing an orchard devastated. So my question is, can thinking, like function activities, like learning, training, reading, really create this same shift in consciousness? It seems to me that facts don't work that well at creating shifts, and surely we need to work with the feeling function culture myth narratives that that evoke emotion so h how much do you agree with with jared's kind of take on that yeah i definitely i i i do agree that um and there's lots of evidence accumulating that facts alone are very poor at changing people's you know mindsets or their deeper kind of attitudes um it depends who those facts come from as well. You know, but, um, the whole thing about kind of echo chambers and things like that, that if facts come from people that we trust, we're more likely to, um, they're more likely to have some leverage on us because we kind of accept them as opposed to instantly kind of um, thinking that they're wrong. And so maybe there's some insights there about how you, how you can teach through kind of the, the types of, um, yeah, group sizes or, or people that, that work together. But I mean, the, the general point, I think that we need to, this sense of 
experiential knowing is very important and um the kind of theoretical understanding i think is takes us so far but then we need to put in place the, the practices and the kind of introspection as well i think that's something that always amazes me that you read about these religions like buddhism and that is very much focused on our kind of interconnected nature and some of these psychological insights from buddhism that they got from introspection like hundreds of years ago actually been you know rep, you know replicated now in in empirical studies and found that you know they're kind of they were very they got it, a lot of things right not everything but you know and to me that's amazing how you know you don't need a a, a university department to, to find out some of these things this kind of introspection approaches is if you know if if you, the thing you're studying is your sense of self and what better way to to spend some time reflecting and and you know d delving into that so i think in meditation and introspection and i think what's great now is that this kind of approach there's nothing new in what i've talked about today in a way you know talking about a broader sense of self and compassion and empathy and environment is in the philosophy it's in religion and i guess what's happening nowadays is is this kind of evidence base this sort of evidence-based spirituality as it were being able to so for example measure that sense of connectedness in a kind of way that can be replicated across multiple people and then carry out some kind of intervention like taking people out in nature for several weeks and then measuring it again helps us to take a science approach to you know um for spiritual development i suppose and i guess on a broader question you know uh, it's it's disappointing in a way how advanced technologically advanced we've become but maybe morally morally and spiritually i don't know if we've in in recent decades progressed you know very very much and i think a renewed focus on that kind of development of personhood and moral and spiritual development is is definitely overdue perhaps 100 percent. that's that's a really good point um so we've got a question here from ruth um ruth asks can we see mental health issues as the system breaking down similar to Lang's idea? So I think that's R.D. Lang um, in, the f in the sense that people with mental health issues might be in fact seen or because they find it hard to connect with this false sen sense of self and adjust to a society that is maybe insane. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I... I think from Eric Fromm as, as well, that kind of idea that um, uh, <clears throat> that the world is, is maybe mad, and that is you know can can drive um, this kind of dissonance in 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 people, and and it can be reflected as as um, yeah outliers and and kind of. I mean, I think in a sense, if if the world is. I just put it this way, you know, to, to, to step out of the status quo and um, to, and if the world is um, on this trajectory, which is fully um, embedded, this kind of illusion of, of uh, the importance and the sacrosanct nature of, of kind of entities, then to, to talk differently or to be different, it does perhaps seem like an outlier, but I don't think that would drive mental health issues. I think you might just be seen as slightly odd and out there. I do think there are some genuine, you know, the, the mental health issues are uh, obviously genuine. And I think actually a path out of, and I'm not obviously not professional, um, you know, psychiatrist here, but I think there is evidence from what I gather that, um, a lot of the mental health issues are driven by a sense of isolation and, and kind of rumination about self, etc. So actually, you start to see a pathway out of that through some of the practices that we talk about. And mental health does tend to improve and depression is lower in people who meditate or who, um, you know, engage with nature through, I don't know, cold water swimming, whatever. So some of these practices can certainly help. But of course, there are constraints, you know, obviously about um, the system driving some of these issues is is completely well made that um you know if we live in a society where people are time pressured maybe they're you know suffering poverty um you know they're stressed about getting food on the table for the kids a lot of all this is wrapped up in driving these mental health problems so it's i don't want to appear kind of 
naive or patronizing about how we can simply just meditate and, and solve all these problems. They are, there's some structural issues as, as well, of course. But I think um, certainly our culture, you know, if you turn on the TV, you know, nothing on there is going to, very little on there is going to help you improve your kind of um, understanding of sense of self. And in fact, it's the opposite. It might further exacerbate this kind of sense of being atomized and being a kind of isolated entity. So I think in that sense, the world is a bit mad and we have to choose to to kind of create our own space to um, develop some of these ideas. Definitely, definitely. Now, I'd be curious to ask as well, Tom, so there will be few people on the planet that have thought as deeply around this subject and and these issues um, as you have in, in writing this book. And I'm just curious, you know, has, has writing this book changed you in any way? And I suppose, it would be hard for you to be ignorant of some of the issues facing facing the planet now and facing the situation that we're all in that that other people might not be as aware of as you are now like has this given you an increased sense of responsibility about um what you want to do in the future like has it changed like your orientation in life in any way yeah yeah i think so and actually part of the reason I wanted to write the book was a sort of learning process for myself and I f it was fascinating for a start to kind of delve into some of these different disciplines that you know I might you might have I sort of covered at a level a bit of chemistry or a bit of you know psychology or whatever and then to um, have a chance to go back into them after spending sort of several years in this kind of narrow siloed science where you just get more and more focused on a certain area was kind of refreshing to to do that and to start to piece them together and I always had an interest in um, in nature and wildlife um, and I always had an interest in kind of Eastern religion and Buddhism and, and this and Zen and Taoism and these kind of um, uh, spiritual ideas about kind of our connectedness and so actually to sort of piece the two together and to see that actually some of the solutions to our problems around why wildlife is declining can actually come from changing our ideas about how you know our sense of identity and linking it to those ideas around interconnectedness was was really rewarding and i yeah i think i learned a lot i also do feel though and i guess this comes back to the previous question you know i, I wrote the book i guess what i don't know say three or four years ago because it takes a while to things get published and and uh, that whole process and you know, I, I do feel like as I was writing it, perhaps I was more connected to certain aspects because I was delving into them. And and then, you know, it's very easy to go back into thinking a different, in a different way. And um, so I kind of, in my own mind, completely realize how you kind of need to ha refresh yourself with the sort of uh, study and the practice more regularly. Otherwise, it's very easy to almost snap back into, uh, you know, a this this comfortable way of thinking uh, which is the way we've evolved but also is, is structured by our society and you know it's very easy to kind of just absorb that you know our brains are like sponges and we're kind of absorbing that culture all the time and so yeah it, it's always important to kind of continually sort of challenge the way you're thinking so i'm trying to sort of work on a on a sort of uh, another book now which is is really thinking a bit more um systemically about the dynamic changes in our identity um, and I didn't I, I kind of put the figure in initially and then I thought I, I took it out because actually it was quite complex to explain but just the overall idea is this that um, as I talked about culture pushing us to become more individual uh, more individualistic and um, selfish over recent decades and actually that then damages the environment but there's some evidence, quite kind of worrying evidence, to show that as we damage the environment, you know, we drive climate change, we drive human migration, where people are trying to get out of inhospitable areas, we're, we're homogenizing our wildlife. These kind of create a degraded environment, which actually makes a kind of um, individualistic mindset, or even a, at a broader level, a kind of xenophobic mindset more likely. <clears throat> so just to give you a concrete example, you, you know, by being selfish, 
uh, we potentially drive climate change because we say, well, actually, it's not going to affect Britain that much, It'll, you know, but I don't care what I do. It won't affect me and I'm not even having any kids. So I, I'm just going to kind of keep driving my gas guzzling SUV or whatever. And so we make a selfish decision which drives climate change. That climate change causes mass human migration. And, you know, what we've got at the moment is just a trickle. Like the, the projections are for, you know, tens of millions of people migrating out of the equatorial uh, belt where it's going to be inhospitable to live. So real pressures of, of people um, wanting to find somewhere to just live and survive. And you already see just from the levels of migration we've got, the kind of xenophobic right-wing press that talks about, you know, kind of keep them out, keep them out, build a wall. I mean, Trump talked about building a wall with Mexico, these kind of nationalistic sentiments that are suddenly caused by this kind of knee-jerk response to to threat and there's some nice work by someone called michelle gelman and she's found that um uh, the, these two ways of structuring society tightness and looseness a kind of spectrum and tightness is when you have uh, you look after your in-group but you're very rule-based you're more likely to affect a, a, a elect a sort of strong authoritarian leader almost sort of, sort of dictator type leader um, whereas loose is much more kind of relaxed, open, more fluid with other cultures, less xenophobic. And um, Michelle's team have looked at like past countries and found that where countries have had more environmental shocks or civil unrest, they tend they tend to be tighter. So it's almost like um, those threats, those environmental shocks, cause society to change and become more kind of cohesive in group, but actually at the expense of antagonism with the out group. So that's kind of what, and maybe you see that with happening with Trump's America, you know, that's kind of what happened in the sense they elect a, a sort of authoritarian type leader, it's become more America first, build a wall. It's exactly how, you know, and that's maybe caused by a bit of, you know, financial crisis and, and you know, poverty, etc. So as the world gets more challenging with climate change, with biodiversity loss, with geopolitical strife, will we start to see countries following this knee-jerk reaction and becoming more xenophobic and and obviously then that has an issue with how we deal with these problems which are transboundary you know climate change air pollution human migration all need international cooperation so my worry is that our kind of evolutionary response and our societal response is configured in such a way that at the moment it's going to make things worse and we're going to have this vicious cycle and if we understand that maybe we can start to no, realize that as these things get worse we have to actually counter our innate response which might be to um, look after ourselves at the expense of others and actually but uh, instead trigger a more sense of global citizenship and responsibility and international cooperation we kind of need to realize that we're going to suffer these cognitive biases um, and, and kind of predict them and at the moment there's no debate about how UK will deal with climate migration and you know all we let ourselves be dictated by is maybe the right-wing press um, who kind of drive this sense of, of xenophobia so I think we should have those debates in public about you know what will we do when we have human migration or things get harder and and how should we respond as a society I think those are important questions to have big time big time now at the start of your answer you mentioned that Early on, I think in your career, you were influenced a bit by Eastern thought. Um, was there any, were there any particular books or thinkers that had a big impact on you that you would maybe recommend or have recommended to other people in the past? Yeah, I, um, I think in, I'll just flick back to this slide here because there are, I think, a few books that, that influenced me um, in terms of... Well, yeah, I think... I would just say to, yeah, to, to read broadly. And, and I tried to give a list of the different types of, of books that kind of influenced some of the research. And some of them are, are more sort of popular science books about our, you know, how our body is a super organism and things like that. And um, But I think some of the really nice ones are things like, um, I can't highlight here, but the third line down, Fritjof Capra. Um, his work is about kind of a system's perspective on life. and um, that was quite influential for me about um, this kind of um, taking a much more holistic perspective to science as opposed to a very reductionist approach. Um, uh, but then, I, yeah, I think I really like, was very much influenced by kind of books about 
Taoism and, and things like that. And kind of some of the Buddhist and Hindu texts I kind of looked at when I was when I was younger. Um, but I would recommend that WWF report. I think I put it on the previous one. Um, this one, the meeting environmental challenges, because and actually it's quite sort of unfortunate that WWF don't seem to be doing as, as much of this anymore because I, this I was amazed when I read this report I was kind of halfway through putting my book together and I was like yes yes this is exactly it because they're talking about how to meet some of these environmental challenges by what is the role of our identity and they talk about identity campaigning about you know you don't just sort of campaign for saving nature you you think about how or prompting questions about whether we need to transform our identity as part of environmental campaigning and to me that seems really important but um there is work on this but it yeah wwf i gather is not not um still focused on it as much very interesting okay um so we've got a question here from Kay, and she's asking in terms of being connected up to three links of people away how are we affected by them like energetically culturally in what way so maybe if you could expand a bit on that and was the book was the book that you were talking about that one by nicholas christakis by any chance i haven't read it but I, i'm aware of his work that's right yeah yeah um so i think i've yeah that book connected is referenced on the slide christakis and fowler um th those links so there's nothing here that's doesn't rely on existing scientific understanding of the world i know there are there are kind of speculations and i, I i've kind of copied the chat here because i'm really interested to kind of see what people have reflected on and i i saw someone was talking about morphic resonance like ideas of rupert sheldrake this idea that there may be connections through kind of hidden connections between different entities that we kind of don't really understand through through modern science yet but I'm nothing in the book or in the worldview that I've talked about is relies on that kind of um, speculation necessarily, and I don't discount anything. But I just think, um, yeah, I mean, the, the things we know through our modern science is kind of miraculous enough to that when we start to explore that and, and recognise that there's enough from that understanding to kind of already deconstruct this illusion of a of our um egoic self-identity um so the connections between people are simply um how one person talks to another or you know the music they listen to they're just physical connections then there's nothing kind of magic as it were or you know things that are not shown by science to that link these people together so it's probably just a case of like you speak to one person and um and interact with them and then you influence them and then they speak they speak to their friend and they influence them in, in a certain way and so i think it's it's as simple as that that is on this topic actually as someone sent me a book called um it was, it's it's about transcendental meditation and they've collated this book um barry spivak is the author uh, about transcendental meditation which is this meditation where you repeat a mantra and they've done a lot of there's been a lot of studies showing how it changes brain waves and and, and um, like other meditation approaches but what they found with transcendental meditation is they well they suppose that it they think it can cause world peace essentially is the thesis it's a pretty big um you know supposition but th this book is detailed lots and lots of evidence about where they've got people in one city to do you know, 100 people doing transcendental meditation and then have a control city. And then they look at rates of violent crime, you know, and then they track them over time and then they stop the meditation and they start the meditation. Um, and, you know, it's difficult because these are some of these are scientific studies published in, in reputed journals, you know, and, and I'm not saying it's not true. But what they lack at the moment is a mechanism that by which um, 100 people meditating, for example, one of the exam one of the things they give is about um, this country's at war. There's there's um, um, missiles being fired, not missiles, mortars being fired, and they show that the city where they do this transcendental meditation has had less mortars fired into it than another one. And you just think, well, okay, well, I, I, 
without looking into the stats and looking into the primary research, it's hard to sort of say whether I agree with your you know, the stats or not. And it's obviously published, and, but, but you kind of want to see a mechanism as well. So, because science is about, yes, the statistical pattern seeking and evidence, but also the understanding the mechanisms. And that's what I kind of, uh, at the moment, I don't understand. They talk a bit about non this kind of um, field effect, where maybe if, we, if I meditate and it changes my consciousness, maybe there's some kind of field effect that then changes the consciousness of everyone in the world. And if we get enough people meditating, it changes us all. But if that's the case, I don't understand why the effect would be localized. So why you would get 100 people meditating in this city causes an effect which changes that city but doesn't change the city next to it. So that's what to me is lacking this kind of mechanistic understanding there. They're obviously saying there is an effect on peace, but they're also saying it's a kind of localized effect. And then they're not explaining it in terms of, okay, well, is it just the fact that I've meditated, so I'm going to go down the shop now and just be slightly nicer to the shopkeeper and be a bit more compassionate. And he's then going to be slightly nicer to his wife. But then you think, okay, the crime that's caused by someone breaking into my shed is someone because they're kind of short of cash, you know, even if they interacted with a shopkeeper's wife in some way or five links away, is that really going to change whether they break into my shed or not? It just seems a long shot to me that, you you know, me doing some transcendental meditation can kind of cascade out. But anyway, yeah, there's a lot we don't know in, in the world still. And I think it's fascinating to explore. Who knows? I mean, in the book, they talk about saying we have had these scientific revolutions where views have been overthrown and, and that he's, they're suggesting that maybe the transcendental meditation is one of those where we'll all suddenly in 10 years realize that we were stupid not to really believe these field effects and this kind of non-localized um, kind of ways we can transform minds. But at the moment, everything I've talked about is kind of, I suppose, mainstream science, but just hidden into different fields that's kind of drawn together, I suppose. Very interesting. Now, it seems that the, the root of the issue, and you've said it many times, is is the worldview. We've got we've developed this individualistic worldview, and that's the source of many of our, our problems in, in the modern world. Um, just before you go, I'd be curious to ask, if you had the ability to plant an idea or a belief in the, in the head of everybody in the planet, what, what would that be? Like, what would you want to get into the, the, the consciousness of everybody that was alive today? Well, yeah, that's a good question. But I suppose there's a, there's a slightly sort of sinister aspect to that in, in a way that, you know, when we talk, and I've, I've kind of felt the sensitivity in my own thinking that we're talking about transforming mindsets and it, you know, without, that can very much sound like brainwashing, you know. And I think if you think about different cultural approaches to this, I'm just going to shut this door. Um, we have Western governments uh, you know, have tended to be very hands-off and say, right, the individual is sacrosanct. Um, let's not try and change mindsets. And I've even asked in, in um, DEFRA and, and Department for Climate Change when it existed about, you know, why aren't you trying to change behaviours? Because they're very much sort of structural fixes. And they said, oh, we don't want to be like Big Brother. We just, you know, we're hands-off. Um, uh, but but we are, people's mindsets are being affected all the time, of course, by the media, as I talked about. So it's not like you can't not affect them. So to me, that's two hands off. But then you go to the other side and think about communism and Stalin and, you know, and what, maybe what, what China, what they're doing, the, the, the uh, kind of tr cultural training of the Uyghur Muslims. And, you know, think, well, I mean, that's, that is two hands on. So how do you transform mindsets, but without kind of, imposing views on other people and so for me to answer your question i guess it would be a sense of awe it would be that kind of sense of um you know really lift lifting the veil from our eyes and just seeing the world as it really is because we do live in the kind of everyday miracles and i think you know we if we take the time to kind of see those then that engenders this kind of sense of connectedness which kind of grows naturally so for me it wouldn't be kind of putting an idea but just kind of trying to if everyone could just see the kind of yeah amazing connectedness that we already exist in, then that that would be a great day, I guess. Hundred percent. Well, Tom, that's a that's a great note to end on. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your your presentation today and and the work that you're doing. I think it's some of the most important work that could be done. So just keep 
keep going on on your on your journey, I suppose. And everybody else, we're back at uh, one o'clock for our next talk on the neuroscience of yoga and meditation. So we'll see you all then and speak soon. Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks for your great questions and thanks for inviting me. Cheers.